for HIV. Plague! We are in the middle of a plague! Let's breathe. AIDS. In midnights and cups of coffee. The View From Here, Queer Documentary and the AIDS Crisis. On July 3rd, 1981, the New York Times published an article titled Rare Cancer Seen in 41 Homosexuals. It was a small print column on a page dominated by sheet music for the Star-Spangled Banner under the headline Sing Out the Fourth. The article refers to the disease now known as HIV-AIDS as a rare and often rapidly fatal form of cancer, and goes on to explain that the cause of the outbreak is unknown. What followed was a decades-long battle, both within a gay community so desperate to cling to the sexual liberation of the 1970s that they were sent into denial over the disease's sexual transmission, and with a government that refused to acknowledge the crisis as a public health issue. It is these harsh realities that created the circumstances and environment for the documentary Silver Lake Life, The View From Here. A film consisting of home movies and video diaries, Filmmaker Tom Jocelyn and his partner, Mark Massey, document their ultimately losing battle with their AIDS diagnosis. Completed by Jocelyn's friend and student, Peter Friedman, the film is an unflinching look at the physical and mental toll the disease has on the two men that helps put a human face to the suffering felt by so many. Beyond this, the film tackles cinema's relationship with how we process death. Part AIDS visibility activism, part therapeutic practice keeping two dying men sane, and part philosophical discussion about death and videotape, Silver Lake Life blurs the lines between filmmaker and subject to provide a visceral viewing experience that demands attention. Part 1. AIDS Visibility. I don't think the GMAC or whatever AIDS pimp operation is paying you. You're making the same point George Bush... Plague! We are in the middle of a plague! And you behave like this! Larry Kramer had this famous outburst during a panel on treatment in 1991, 10 years after the New York Times first covered the AIDS epidemic as gay cancer. One year after Silver Lake Life was filmed, and two years before it was released. By this point, as Kramer states, 40 million people were confirmed to be infected. Two years before, in 1989, Kramer was interviewed by Eric Marcus for his book and audio database project, Making Gay History, where he stated, and there's no question that we have lost the war to AIDS, and that we have lost and will continue to lose a great many people whom we did not have to lose, and that the speed of research, treatment, education, you name it, has been tragically and inhumanely slow. The late 80s and early 90s were perhaps the worst years for the AIDS epidemic. As Kramer states, general knowledge about the virus and its effects were low, and there was no cure or even consistent effective treatment in sight. It is this climate that makes the 1993 documentary a bold and powerful statement. They show everything. Jocelyn's weight loss, Massey's KS lesions, and then the final and bitter truth. Jocelyn is no doubt a documentarian with the goal of humanizing and creating visibility for the gay community. One of his previous films, Black Star, an autobiography of a close friend, focused on coming out in the early years of the gay liberation movement. When thought about together, Silver Lake Life and Black Star begin to represent an all-too-common storyline for the queer community of the late 20th century. However, the most shocking shots of the documentary were not included in the film at the behest of Jocelyn. Here, the filmmaker becomes the subject as Massey films his corpse and Friedman elected to include the footage. A bold choice, but one that fit into Jocelyn's honest and intimate approach to filmmaking, and one that Friedman can very well justify as incredibly important. It takes the idea of AIDS, a mysterious gay cancer, and brings it into reality. There is no denying that Jocelyn is a human being. He is seen dancing, joking, and loving. Then he is seen deteriorating, dying, dead. At a time when demonizing queerness was a bipartisan hobby and the AIDS crisis was mainly discussed through statistics, people did not generally have an image for the realities of the human experience of this disease. While it was given scientific description, there was no accurate impression of its effect on the everyday person. In this way, Silver Lake Life is revolutionary to the beginning of AIDS visibility. In discussing the film and the inclusion of some of the more shocking scenes, Friedman states, I want the word AIDS to mean something more than it seems to now. I want viewers to feel they're having the experience of what it's like to have someone they know die of AIDS. Friedman's editorial choices highlight this mission, to create visibility for his mentor and the community he belonged to, to show the reality of an epidemic and to give it human faces, which are harder than numbers to ignore. 
Part 2. Therapeutic Documentation. She knew when to stay away, you know. Um, so I had no trouble. You, you apparently had more trouble than I did. Yeah, you took the camera. It's funny, you probably slept through most of Sue's visit, but uh, Sue's visit was a was very helpful, very good. She helped a lot. I learned a lot. She got me through a lot of bad times. Jocelyn originally intended for this documentation to be a video diary of the progression of the disease. In completion, however, the film becomes a dialogue between he and his partner, Mark Massey. For the entirety of the film, the audience experiences the highs and lows that Jocelyn and Massey experience together. Their sarcastic humor, their arguments over medication, watching their bodies change as the disease slowly overpowers them. It becomes increasingly clear that they have very different attitudes towards their fates. The difference between the two of you in this issue that I see is that given the same threat, your way of fighting that threat is different. You, Mark, you're uh, trying to lower the threat. You, Tom, you're trying to make the most out of what you have. While Matsu took AIDS as a fightable and conquerable prospect, Jocelyn has accepted his fate and begins to use the diary format to handle his feelings of dread. And I feel so empty. And I feel so pointless. And I have so much trouble remembering anything good I've done. You can see his thoughts forming in each pause. In this way, filming Silver Lake Life becomes a therapeutic form of processing their lives coming to an end and their relationship to one another. There is a performative aspect to this documentary, creating a subjective view of Jocelyn's headspace and the perspective on his condition. The audience becomes immersed with the images that Jocelyn sees along his journey, which Friedman decides to include in his edit of the film. Jocelyn and Massey are the stars of the camera for much of the documentary, but as the film and their condition progresses, the livelihood of the environment around them becomes more prominent. We see a chair and we're deciding if we're going to sit in it or continue to the next chair in a brave effort of physical dynamism. We pass the chair in a brave effort of physical dynamism. While their own lives are gradually deteriorating, the world continues to move forward. This ultimately emphasizes Jocelyn's views surrounding the inevitability of his passing, and the most he can do for himself is continue until he cannot. Jocelyn shapes the remainder of his filmed experiences using this approach, until he is unable to carry on holding the camera and passes the torch to Massey. This becomes an indication that his condition has completely left the realm of his control, and thus Massey becomes the documentarian. He continues his lover's mission, and it becomes Massey's form of staying connected to Jocelyn through his death and beyond. They both use the film as a way to connect to something within themselves. The subject of the film is just as much their struggle with AIDS as it is the ways they grasp the reality of their situation. Part 3. Death and Videotape It was very scary to look at him the first time after he died, you know, look him in the face. Um, but I did. And then I wanted to close his eye because it's very strange seeing a dead person staring. And I tried, just like in the movies, to close the eyelid. It doesn't close. <laughs> it pops back open. <clears throat> As I said to Tom, I apologize that life wasn't like the movies. The representation of the battle with AIDS does not exclude the reality of death in Silver Lake Life. The acknowledgement of their eventual deaths is a heavy present throughout the film with Jocelyn asserting that his passing would not come as timely and honorable, but instead as inevitable and consequential as just a single example among millions that have suffered at the hands of AIDS. As discussed earlier, right after Jocelyn's eventual demise, Massey turns on the camera to film his dead body, his eyes open as though he had just been alive. This is the 1st of July, and Tommy's just died. Friedman's editorial decision to leave in these clips reiterates Jocelyn's assertion that his death would not come as they do in the films. This very topic is discussed by Jennifer Malkowski in her book, Dying in Full Detail, Mortality and Digital Documentary. She remarks that Silver Lake Life challenges the primary of the visible moment of death by systematically excluding it, despite technology's newfound readiness to capture it. They instead use videos, affordances, to make the long process of dying newly public, detailing the illness that precedes this moment and the mourning that follows it. 
This exclusion also reveals a new discomfort with the physicality of dying, and the surprisingly routine moment of bodily expiration conflicts with the era's revised model of the good death as highly individualized. Malakowski points out that the actual moment of death is not included in the film. There are many ways to explain this, one being that Massey, as the current primary camera operator, elected to share his last moments of his lover only with Jocelyn. The idea that Malkowski proposes, however, is because this death would not have been a good death. It seems to echo Jocelyn's ideas on the subject, but Friedman's decision to include the aftermath of the death seems to counter it. His death becomes a face to put to the numbers and statistics of the AIDS crisis, thus becoming something more through the very act of filming his body and releasing it to the public. Therefore, in a way, it becomes a good death or at least a death that was used for a noble purpose, one that allows an audience disconnected from the crisis to feel the loss it entailed. Conclusion Silver Lake Life, The View From Here, is by no means an easy watch. It pulls no punches and shows how destructive the AIDS crisis was in America in the late 20th century on a deeply personal level. The film brings private experiences to the public eye in an effort to create empathy for a group of people who had very little in the eyes of mainstream society. This is something many documentaries do. However, Silver Lake Life is an example of the marginalized documenting themselves with the help of an ally who felt their loss deeply and had a mission of creating that feeling again in people who did not know them. But there is no shaming, no accusations, just a bitter, harsh reality. The film is many things, a statement on death, therapeutic art, activism, but above all, it is an opportunity to empathize with Mark and Tom. It is a question. Do you see me?